Oh, you turn off the projection. <laughs> you got anything for the screen yet? No, just turn it off. Just turn it off. Oh. 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 in Arbury, which isn't in Francis, but I'll share with you. Don't make a dust with the broom of your tongue. <laughs> well, this is, this is, a, is not a, a very lyrical book, perhaps, but I, I think it's a, an extraordinarily well done Book. And it's it's a um, it's it's a, a book in a way of praise, not I meant a, a book of praise of the perfect master. Now I think it's also very important to uh, to get a full idea of of what Francis is conveying as the perfect master. It's, it's not so much that he's, he's saying, waiting, wait until you, uh, you go and find the, the right teacher or anything like that. The, the, the perfect master, as emerges from a reading of the book, is the presence of Baba within you. And it's no different from your own self. You remember I, I was... I was saying this morning how what is emerging from the whole poem is how well Francis understands that a new 
era has emerged with Baba that in, instead of, of needing intermediaries or rites and rituals, uh, in, in, instead of kneeling down praying to God as something other, which of course we all do to some extent, but at the same time there is available for us this breakthrough of recognition <coughs> of Baba as ourselves. And, and of course in Francis as in Baba this is so delicately presented because as Baba's whole teaching represents and, and as, as Francis's poem represents it, this is the, the point where ego creeps in and any, any trace of pride in one's own achievements and self uh, will vitiate the quest, will, will, will abort the whole enterprise. You have to, the only way of finding the true self within is through the total act of sur surrender, hopelessness and, and help, helplessness. So, with the poem begins, so must be prepared the ground for the sowing, for the entering of the seed of light in one's earth. The seed of man is the gathered light of form. The seed of light is the grace of the perfect master. And in, in typical fashion here, the we're not getting an opposition between good and bad, we're getting an opposition between the light of, of the moon, because of course, how else are we created as creatures? How else is the world of things created but through the creative life of, of, of God, light of God? And But it's the, the cyclic changing light of the moon, which has to somehow be transformed into being more than the gathered light of form. The, the seed of light is the grace of the perfect master. Now the form of the poetry, of course, is these five line stanzas. Each one ending, ending with perfect master. Perfect master. Perfect master. A, like a gonging of a bell, a reiterated phrase, a, a, a form which really suits the exhortation, the advice being given here in a no-nonsense form right through the section. France is always very attentive to to the stress patterns here. I'll be saying more about this when we look in, in detail at, at some passages of the poetry tomorrow. But uh, you, I hope you'll notice, I notice anyway, my, just my tin ear, that after that first stanza, we, we go on to four beat lines on the, the, the first page, page 83. Thus the sunbeat and wave roll and breaking of dream joys <coughs> and dream pains. And the eyes washed or sealed with new pain. The one adored melting into one's outline of desiring or hardening into bitter pain until we of ourselves melt into the eyes and love of the perfect master. Sometimes he just gives one stress to perfect master, sometimes two, in this case two. The clearing of the ground for the sowing, for the entering, is the unlearning of learning. For learning is your rubbish heap of conceit. But this in the first place, Prometheus Agni brought down the heavenly fire by order of the perfect master. 
So, of course, this is, again, one of Francis's major themes, how the fire and light have become the weapons used by our illegitimate gods. Uh, this, is, this is one of the bees in my bonnet as, as I've been reading the poem. It keeps referring to, to uh, the trapping of, of uh, <coughs> Aphrodite and uh, Ares under the, the net of Hephaestus. And uh, this is the false marriage that takes place, of course, uh, where love is caught up with a blustering male, assertive, self-assertive principle, and, uh, and trapped under the, the net of Hephaestus, the great artificer, the net of technologies made it all worse with Hephaestus' net. Now, what should it be, of course, is man, woman, under the net of love, which Peter will be talking about later on, I'm sure. Anyway, so that so the false the false fire the false fire is brought down technology and power in, instead of of the triumph of love. Now, as I read through the poem, I suddenly started to realise how many references there were to the Bible, and it's. Uh, I realised that, 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 that these references were coming from the Gospel of Matthew. It was Barbara's favourite part of the Bible it was the Sermon on the Mount. Chapters 5, 6 and 7 of Matthew's Gospel. For any lover of God, they still are incredibly challenging and moving. And Francis has them in mind when he's talking here uh, where, this is over on page 87, I'm sorry I don't have it up, I think. The pious and the materialists have their reward, and the perfume seller on the street corner has occasionally the eye of love returning his bright glances. But we who have no love, nor piety, nor hope of reward, nor work in the service of the perfect master. This is a quote, Jesus says it a couple of times, the hypocrites and so on. Have, they have their reward, they have their reward in just doing things for the credit of doing them. Not just for being hypocrites, but taking satisfaction out of being good. Whereas, of course, in Barber's new life, in, in Barber's path that he's laying down for us, we don't have hope of rewards. So he has advised us to leave it to him. As aforetime, he told us to take no thought for tomorrow. You remember one of the best known sayings of, of Jesus, to take no thought for tomorrow, but be of the lily in the field. So. Tomorrow means still hope, and he already has been hopeless and helpless on the roads of the world, that we may become helpless and hopeless of all, save the perfect master. And I, it made me go back and read that Sermon on the Mount, and to, and to read Book 4, which is not the most lyrical of of books, if you're going to admire it, you admire it because it's it got such tight control in each one of these five line stanzas. It, to, to keep to the point, to, to, it's so masterful and disciplined, and yet there we are. It's it's what Francis has in mind is the Sermon on the Mount, and it's of course it's just as radical. You want to, Blessed to the meek, they shall inherit the earth, and so on. All these hard-to-take sayings in the Sermon on the Mount. All this stuff that is anathema to common sense and self-interest is here, again, advice, leave it to the perfect master. Nothing but the perfect master. Something that is completely hostile to our sense of our own capabilities and importance. 
Now over on the last page here, it's uh, here again it reminded me of another sermon, but this, which I really want to mention, I know the time is limited, but I really want to mention that Barbara stepped out of the new life for one day, and Barbara's sermon, he went back into the old life for one day, Barbara's sermon. Essentially, we're all one. The feeling of our being otherwise due to ignorance. Soul desires consciousness to know itself. But in its progress towards this goal, which it cannot realise independently of creation, it must undergo the experience which it gathers as the individualised ego, and which is all imagination. Thus it is faced at the outset with ignorance instead of knowledge. The soul becomes free of the binding of impressions through various paths, and love is the most important of these paths, leading to the realisation of God. Let us not hope, because this knowledge is beyond hoping and wanting. Let us not reason, because this knowledge cannot be comprehended or thought of. Let us not doubt, because this knowledge is the certainty of certainties. Let us not live the life of the senses because the lusty, greedy, false, impure mind cannot reach this knowledge. Let us love God as the soul of our souls and in the height of this love lies this knowledge. That's page 120, 1920 on the path of love. Just questions. Just quick. Yeah, right. right. <coughs> Keep going for a minute. And so, the glorious one, undying, unfretted, undismayed, thyself, thyself is the form and being of the perfect master. He built up over this whole section towards this ecstatic affirmation of thyself is the perfect master. Not, a, not a, a telling you to go look for a teacher or something. Of course, Barbara might show you a teacher if you need one. But it's, it's finding this, this affirmation of, of selfhood. I don't think John Kerry was ready for it, actually. I, and and I, I think although he breaks through to that, that sort of mystical vision at the end of it, he's still in the world of uh, suffering and complaining as well as in the world of rejoicing. And that's why Francis brings us down again in that final thing. But that's just an idea. So, the perfect master, the man God, who was a man, who became God, who became a man. The perfect master, who is God, directly descended, who takes the wheel of the world car from the hands of the perfect masters. Number one driver, and drives the new circuit, and establishes correct lap time. Of all perfect masters, the perfect master. Everything except the perfect master and our own real self is the nothing. That happens right at the end of book five. Everything except the perfect master and our own real self is the nothing. It, and it's happening again, but in such very, such fertility of invention, such wonderful variations on themes that Francis is doing it all the time. And, and again, I urge people just read it and reread to be really appreciating how good it is. Well, any questions? There's no other words like witty in it, I don't think. <laughs> I have a question if no one else does. Yes, thank you, Michael. Is it me? This joining of Prometheus and Agni, which is ancient Greek and Sanskrit, hmm. what do you make of that? What do you make of that combining? They, they are seen as heroic or godlike figures mm -hmm. who bring down a gift, but a gift which is abused. And so instead, they light the, they light the fire at the ingle, the fire the stove nook in the, in the house. They, they bring light and illumination, and fire, but it, it gets used for the fire of energy and passions, 
rather than for the fire of illumination. And especially since the Reformation, it's all got darker and darker until we misuse it as weapons and so on. Well, Jack, in the 70s, I think the first Indian nuclear weapon was called Agni, I think. Is that right? Yeah. For their bomb. Did they? Uh, I think they yeah, mm. yeah. Well, that's a bit hubris, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Who's the Greek Agnes? Doesn't that mean the love of God or something? Oh, I don't know about that. It's Latin. Uh, it's Agnes, 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 Agnes. Lamb. Lamb is Agnes. Lamb. Agnes, Agnes, Agnes. Yes, but, but not. Agnes is the god of fire. Mm. Well, the next thing is tea and coffee. Good. <laughs> I don't know if it's the typo, but there's only 